Hello, everyone. I'm Josette Sheeran, Executive Chair of the McCain Institute, and welcome to our virtual Sedona Conference. Senator McCain launched the McCain Institute nearly a decade ago to explore the most strategic issues of our time, and one that was near and dear to him, and he held most crucially, was the future of the Indo-Pacific region. Today, in this panel, we'll explore defense position in the Indo-Pacific. America and the world's most capable democracies face unprecedented challenges at home and abroad. Historically, America's built its strength through a network of alliances around the world capable of tackling challenges from mutual security and safe passage through the world's trade routes to terrorism, to strengthening financial systems, to cyber attacks, to humanitarian action, human rights defense, and COVID uh, tackling and beyond. This is a conversation about a region on the front lines of many of those challenges, the Indo-Pacific region, and how the United States, Australia, Japan, and India came together starting in 2007 to form the Quad Alliance. The Quad was revitalized in 2017 following rising challenges from China in the South China Sea and on its borders with India. It has proven to be a vital alliance to explore joint strategies in confronting challenges in the region, particularly in areas where the values and worldviews of those nations diverge sharply from China's. The Quad has recently taken on new prominence and has been raised to the foreign minister level. And Quad Plus dialogues have begun, including South Korea, Vietnam, and New Zealand. In recent Quad Summit, the nations issued a statement entitled The Spirit of the Quad, Our Shared Vision for a Free and Open Indo-Pacific. There's perhaps no stronger group of nations in the Indo-Pacific region to articulate those crucial challenges and explore creative solutions to our mutual challenges. Its success will help ensure the ongoing prosperity, safety, security, and freedoms that have been so central to the values and vision of all the Quad nations. And now to our excellent panel. Hi, I'm Dan Twining. I'm president of IRI, the International Republican Institute. I'm delighted to be here today for the McCain Institute's Sedona Forum with two extraordinary uh, guests uh, both of whom are uh, eminently distinguished uh, for a conversation about uh, the future of defense in the Indo-Pacific, which is, of course, a topic that concerns all of us uh, well beyond the world of defense, uh, as the world's emerging center of wealth and power increasingly resides in wider Asia, uh, which, of course, continues to include the United States as a Pacific power, and Australia as both an Indian Ocean and Pacific nation intimately tied uh, to Washington as well as to uh, our core Asian allies. So very briefly, uh, I'd just like to welcome uh, Julie Bishop. She was the uh, Distinguished Foreign Minister of Australia during a period of significant foreign policy accomplishment in that country. Uh, she was Australia's Minister for Foreign Affairs from 2013 until 2018. Uh, she also had a, uh, a very impressive political career where, of course, she was minister for several uh, different portfolios in uh, various Australian governance. She's now the Chancellor of Australian National University, and perhaps even more important, she is the McCain Institute Kissinger Fellow. So, Minister Bishop, it's really great uh, to have you with us. Uh, Glad also, to be here. Thank you. I'm, I'm really just also quite honored to be with uh, Admiral Harry Harris who was a uh, real uh, pace setter during his extraordinary career uh, in the US Navy. Uh, he has many uh, distinguished uh, credentials, uh, including uh, various service in various uh, uh, fields in various domains. But really, uh, I think a lot of us got to know him when he was uh, the uh, Admiral of all American forces in the Pacific, the commander. Uh, and again, during a really pivotal time in Indo-Pacific security as those tectonic plates uh, were shifting so dramatically. Uh, he also uh, is an ambassador 
Uh, he was the US ambassador to South Korea, one of our most important allies uh, from 2018 to 2020. So Admiral Harris, I'm quite tempted to call you Admiral uh, simply for the reason that you had a decades long career in the military uh, before your civilian service. Uh, but it's cool that we can call you both Admiral and Ambassador. So let's just begin with uh, Foreign Minister Bishop. I'm really, it's a wide ranging question, but how do you see the balance of power uh, in the Indo-Pacific? Who holds it? Um, you know, on the one hand, we have a very robust uh, alliance system that knits together the United States and, and uh, wonderful allies like Australia and Japan, uh, a set of four deployed American forces. On the other hand, of course, we've just seen uh, transcendental growth in not just Chinese power, but really Chinese uh, aggressiveness, assertiveness, boldness, and really uh, an increasingly revisionist take on the future of this region in which Australia sits. So are you, uh, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And how do you see the dynamic in the region at the moment? Well, Dan, thank you for the question. And it's great to be on a panel with my dear friend, Harry Harris and being part of this Sedona Forum. Uh, this issue on the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific is a complex one. There is increasing great power competition in this part of the world. The balance of power is actually held collectively by all nations of the Indo-Pacific. But as between the United States and China, without doubt, the US has two critical elements in its favor. Um, its advanced military capabilities and its network of alliances to which you refer. China has no permanent military strategic alliances and can't call upon the power, the support of other nations in the way that the United States can. I, I don't think we can assume that China intends to wholly displace the United States across the Indo-Pacific because that would mean it would have to take on other responsibilities like maritime safety and anti-piracy and the like. China's focus is laser-like on the South China Sea, on Taiwan, uh, the Senkaku Islands, and maintaining its you know, fishing and energy resources. I often reminded my Chinese counterparts that as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, it should be upholding global peace and security and that it should assume more global leadership commensurate with its increasing economic and military weight. But that didn't seem to um, fall on very uh, positive ears. I'm optimistic that China will ultimately do the right thing, but I have to say its belligerence and assertiveness, particularly over the last 12 months, has been deeply troubling. I do think there's somewhat of a desperation about its tactics. You know, the the antics of the wolf warriors. Uh, there's kind of an impatience and anxiety about China's actions. And I suspect that there are a lot of domestic pressures. It's demography, it's economy. Um, its population is aging more rapidly than virtually any other country. It is yet to avoid the middle income trap. Uh, per capita wealth in uh, China is about US $11,000 compared to US $65,000 in the United States. So I think there are significant demands on the central government. And that may well mean that the, there is potential for overreach and misjudgment. But Australia, like many other countries around the world, are urging countries like China to adhere to the international rules, support the international rules-based order, which was instigated, defended and guaranteed by the United States after the Second World War, a framework uh, within which nations manage their relationships. And so um, I urge China to continue to abide by the international rules-based order. Thank you. Admiral Harris, uh, you assumed command of uh, US PACOM in 2015, uh, really even just since that time in the last five, six years, uh, the situation has transformed. I think a lot of us were surprised by Xi Jinping's aggressiveness and his really uh, kind of bold take on really building a different kind of order in Asia, one much more centered on China. So could you talk about, I mean, really uh, your, your very storied career, but really even just the last five, six years, how you have seen this transformation, how it looked to you at PACOM and how it looks today? 
Sure. So uh, I'll start by uh, saying how pleased I am and honored I am really to share the virtual podium with Foreign Minister Bishop. Uh, she's terrific. I admired her and learned from her when I was the PACOM commander. So it's great to be on the uh, virtual stage with her. Uh, I think that you ask uh, her and you asked me uh, fundamental questions uh, about China and the PRC uh, and, um, and, and where it's going to go. Um, and I think uh, Xi Jinping's president for life, Xi Jinping's uh, commentary in 2017 uh, really set the stage. And uh, you'd have to be blind. Uh, not to see uh, the direction that he has laid out uh, for his country. Um, I think that uh, with regard to comparison of military strength today, um, I think uh, there is no comparison really. Uh, as the foreign minister said, um, and I associate myself with her remarks, I think it's a diplomatic phrase to, uh, of art. Um, the US, uh, according to Evo Dalder from uh, Chicago, uh, has 55 allies and the PRC has only one. Uh, and that's uh, uh, North Korea. So I, I think there's no comparison. You know, the, they have two aircraft carriers, neither of which uh, could match the strength of a single World War II era uh, American uh, aircraft carrier today. Uh, that said, um, uh, you know, uh, but China is on the move. Uh, they're growing their defense. Uh, they realize they have to have a strong uh, military in order to realize uh, Xi Jinping's uh, goals that he set in 2017. Uh, I think uh, Admiral Davidson actually put a timeline on it. Uh, Davidson is the current uh, Indo-PACOM commander, and he put a timeline of six years on it. When I was the PACOM commander, I said, you know, I used to say publicly that 2020 uh, is the decade of danger for us uh, and our friends, allies, and partners in the region. Uh, but Davidson put a timeline on it and said in six years. So we have to continue to resource it. We have to continue to nurture and to grow our alliances and partnerships, our network of like-minded uh, friends uh, in the region, uh, because we share the same uh, goals uh, and we share the same concerns uh, about China. I will say that the U.S. Uh, and China has partnered well on a number of fronts uh, over the last few years, but we fundamentally disagree with Beijing on how to approach the current uh, international order. The Chinese government simply does not keep its word. Uh, you can take from its treaty uh, with the British on Hong Kong to its human rights abuses against the Uyghurs uh, in Western China, the Tibetans and others, uh, to its attempts uh, and successes at commercial espionage, to its unrelenting uh, pressures uh, on uh, Taiwan. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, we are right uh, to try to hold China accountable for its actions, uh, to, uh, to hold it to the standards uh, that it should uh, aspire to uh, as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, as Foreign Minister Bishop said. Uh, and we have to watch China. Uh, unfortunately, we have to watch it at every turn. And Admiral, just a quick follow-up. Do you worry about uh, a miscalculation on China's part? Uh, do you worry about lack of communication between our militaries? I mean, just thinking about some of the contingencies, including around Taiwan, uh, including around some of the contested islands. What, what keeps you up at night in terms of the U.S.-China uh, military dynamic? Well, I'm, I'm retired, so I, I have a, a good night's sleep uh, almost uh, every night, right? Um, I, I think that uh, the idea of some kind of a military to military communications uh, uh, link with China um, is probably overrated. I believe that the key uh, is a diplomatic link. You know, leader to leader, uh, foreign ministry, the State Department, at that level. But the idea that uh, I'm sitting in Hawaii as the indo pacom commander and my counterpart, of which there is not a direct counterpart, would pick up the phone and call me and say, you know, if you do this, we're going to do that, or we're about to do this, or I'm going to call him and say, well, you know, we're about to do a fun up, uh, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that, 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 it, it's going to be, what's going to be critical is the diplomatic channels of communications uh, between capitals. That's, that's going to be the key. I do worry about a miscalculation. I worry about it more from uh, China's miscalculation than ours. Uh, I think that uh, they are 
Uh, their commanders in the field are subject to great pressures from above. And while they, we don't believe that they hold uh, the autonomy to act independently uh, under great strain and stress, uh, you don't know what uh, uh, young commanders at sea will do. Uh, and so that, that, that's clearly uh, problematic. Um, so it, it bears watching and, and, and uh, bears uh, paying attention to closely, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, Minister Bishop, I want to just move us a little bit. It's the same context, but to ask you about the Quad, this quadrilateral uh, partnership, this proto-alliance that brings together the U.S., Japan, uh, Australia, and India. Uh, in an earlier incarnation, uh, in around 2007, uh, I, uh, an Australian government very different than the ones you served in uh, walked back from the Quad. Uh, we now have really all four countries in different ways leaning in. Uh, we saw really a pivotal early summit, at least it felt pivotal in the United States because it was pre President Biden's first group summit uh, with the Quad uh, just a few weeks ago here. How do you see Australia's role and what do you see the Quad, uh, what role do you see the Quad playing uh, in Indo-Pacific security over the coming decade? And I think that recent meeting at leader level of the Quad was quite a milestone. Uh, during my time as foreign minister, while the US, Japan and Australia met, or the foreign ministers and leaders met on a regular basis and the trilateral agreement was strong, it was very difficult to encourage India to essentially um, back the US by being part of the Quad. Uh, but now that they have met at leader level, the Quad takes on an interesting perspective. The Indo-Pacific does lack security architecture like Europe and, and NATO. So the Quad is essentially the only group uh, with a focus on regional security in terms of fostering greater cooperation between nations. I think one of the challenges of the Quad, and, and let's face it, it's a grouping of four very robust democracies. India is the largest democracy in the world by population. So four very robust democracies. One challenge is to get other nations in the Indo-Pacific to openly advocate for their interests and support the rules-based order. Uh, many nations are currently hedging. They don't want to alienate the United States. They don't want to alienate China. And they just hope the tensions, uh, the trade disputes, the conflicts will be resolved through negotiations and diplomacy, as um, Admiral Harris indicated. Uh, the idea that there would be conflict between the United States and China is just um, unthinkable. It would be mutually assured destruction. They're both nuclear powers, um, we should remember. But I think the vast majority of nations in our region want to see more US leadership. They don't want to see less. They don't want to live in a region that's dominated by an authoritarian regime. And the Quad, I think, is well received in the Indo-Pacific because it does bring the United States close to India, Japan, Australia. And it may well be that other nations could be interested, um, Indonesia, South Korea, but I do also think it's in its early days and India's resolve to be part of the Quad is yet to be tested. I think India has been driven to embrace the Quad because of China's own actions and assertiveness and aggression and belligerence on the border. But um, India is critical to a free and open Indo-Pacific. So I hope that the Quad has the opportunity to grow. There is other architecture in the Indo-Pacific, of course, there's the ASEAN grouping, this East Asia Summit, but the Quad is different and it really does have potential to be a regional security um, grouping. The agenda, I was surprised, was surprisingly broad and positive and constructive. You know, the focus on uh, vaccine rollout, for example, would have sent a very positive message to our part of the world. Admiral Harris, um, you make an interesting point about the distinction between kind of military competition and diplomatic engagement. Do you see the Quad primarily as a really a, a vessel for mill-to-mill -mill cooperation, joint exercises, joint military planning, or do you actually see it perhaps as you know something more diplomatically useful, uh, engaged in civilian soft power activity, kind of a new diplomatic alliance? 
that's rather different from our, our military bilateral alliances? Yeah, a uh, great question. Let me uh, uh, just talk a little about my history with the Quad. So uh, I was an advocate for the Quad at the 2016 Rising Dialogue in New Delhi. Uh, I was ridiculed by the Washington Post for taking such a strong stance on it. Uh, but I believed in it then, and I believe in it now, and I'm glad to see that it's moved far, far beyond where we were in 2016. Uh, I think Jake Sullivan, uh, one of the smartest guys I know, um, said it right when he said that it's the foundation of, upon which to build a substantial U.S. policy in the region. And that's Jake Sullivan talking, uh, and I think uh, he's, he's worth uh, listening to. Uh, I think the idea that the four leaders uh, actually put together a, a, a statement uh, that, that they agreed to uh, is, is radical almost uh, and terrific. Uh, I think it, it speaks to the power uh, and the hope really uh, of what's uh, behind the quad. Uh, I've often said, uh, you know, uh, when you talk about other countries joining the quad, uh, that the quad is like American uh, college sports. Right? I mean, the Big Ten has 14 teams and the Big 12 has 10 teams. So the quad doesn't have to have four teams. Uh, and there is no uh, gatekeeper, goalkeeper, referee. You know, the America is not, the United States is not the goalkeeper here. If, if other countries want to join it, uh, I think that would be terrific. I do think uh, that there, in the statement that the leaders made, there is a fundamental principle that underlies the quad. And that is, uh, that uh, these are nations that are interested in delivering practical cooperation and results, right? It's a practical cooperation. So uh, the four countries that are in the quad now get along well with each other. Uh, and I think that's an important principle. If another country joined, could they get along with those four? You know, another aspect of the quad, though it's not stated uh, in, the, in the leader statement is uh, in my view, it's about China, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the threat that China poses to the international order, to democracy, to the freedom of navigation, to all the things that the, that the Quad countries individually stand for uh, that brought, uh, uh, that brings them together as a Quad. So that's another, uh, uh, I think, fundamental principle. I advocated about two weeks ago publicly at, at, uh, at a venue that it may be time to form a secretariat kind of a structure for the Quad. You know, the four countries send uh, representatives uh, probably at the low, lower level, at the, at the deputy assistant secretary level, uh, uh, you know, at some level like that uh, to a capital. Uh, should not be in the United States, in my opinion. Uh, India would probably be the best. Uh, and, and to sort of be a clearinghouse so that that things, things don't have to be coordinated at the, at the leader level. It could be coordinated at some lower level and then brought the leader's attention and move forward. It may be time to do that. Uh, certainly not, not time to form a, an alliance or, and, and I don't think we're ever gonna see a, a NATO-like structure in Asia. Uh, we have, uh, as Minister Bishop alluded to, we have those structures that are excellent and longstanding already. FPDA, Firepower Defense Arrangement is one of those. Australia is the leader in that. Uh, I think that those architectures uh, exist today because they're needed today, just as they were needed during the Cold War and before. Uh, and I think uh, the Quad is not that. Uh, to get to your question, it took me a long time to get to it, but I think it's important that the Quad actually do things that are not in the military space as well as the military defense space. So this idea that they're involved in uh, in uh, putting out uh, or, or propagating or distributing COVID vaccines. What a terrific idea. Needed, uh, and, the, and the countries involved certainly have uh, the means to do it. Uh, and so let's take advantage of that and move out with it. So I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and not take up more of your time. No, that's great. And sir, I remember your remarks at Ricina in 2016 and the Washington Post may not have loved them, but the Indians, uh, they took it all in. Uh, they were cheering yeah, they like for you, right? Yeah. Uh, India, of course, has itself had uh, really an awakening on China just over the last few months here with this very tense and dramatic border standoff. Uh, so, Minister Bishop, I'm going to come to you on just the question of India's future. 
um, you know, we've seen uh, a real shift, not just in Indian attitudes, but very much in Indian willingness to engage, to break out of the old non-alignment, to move beyond that, a recognition that, you know, of course, India wants strategic autonomy, just like all of us want strategic autonomy for our countries, but that India's strategic room to maneuver, its margin is greater when it enjoys strong partnerships, strong relations with the United States, with Japan, with Australia, et cetera. So could you give us your sense on where India is headed beyond the military domain uh, from where you sit in Australia? Thanks, Dan. You might um, have noticed over time that uh, during the years of the uh, Abbott Turnbull governments, we changed our geographic description of our region to the Indo-Pacific. And that was to encompass um, India as a country so critical to a free and open region. So the Indo-Pacific um, acknowledges that India is a part of it. It's um, the largest democracy, as I said, by population. It's a growing economic and military power. It has increasing economic and military weight in our region. And it is now an important bulwark against China's aggression. And the disputed border region has really brought that into um, stark relief. It is still a fiercely independent country. It has um, a long history of non-alignment when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, and I still believe it will take sustained engagement over many years to build the necessary relationship with India before it is drawn even more closely to the quad. But it's China's own conduct that has driven India towards alignment and uh, India's um, commitment to strength and deterrence against aggression. And I uh, welcome the meeting of the Quad. I think that what it's going to need, though, our relationship with India, there's got to be a greater focus on the economic relationship, uh, deep two-way engagement uh, between all four nations uh, through investment and leading to employment. Now, Australia, Japan, Australia, US, we already have free trade agreements but India has stood apart from these economic free trade agreements. It has a protectionist trade stance and that's going to be a challenge for us. But I think we could identify key sectors between India and the other uh, Quad members, key trade sectors where we could seek some form of liberalisation. Now, I would love to see the United States back in the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, which currently has Australia, Brunei, uh, Chile, Canada, New Zealand, Malaysia, Mexico, um, Vietnam, Peru, Singapore. I'm sure I've missed some. Japan. And it would be wonderful to have the United States back in what is a very high quality trade agreement. But wouldn't it be an outstanding outcome in terms of setting the high bar, you know, the gold standard for a trade agreement? to have the US and India in it. Um, of course, China and the ASEAN countries are at the heart of what's called RCEP. India pulled out of the negotiations at the last minute. So I think that the sustained engagement with India over time is absolutely essential, not only for the um, longevity of the quad, but also for the broader economic relationship uh, that is so vital to underpin prosperity and development in our region. Thank you. I, I, of course, I agree with you. Uh, Admiral Harris, I would like to pick up this question of India. Uh, an Indian senior friend told me recently that one reason India pulled out of RCEP was because it was worried about undue economic entanglement with China. And so the Indians do have a security prism through which they look at all of these issues, of course, uh, including the Belt and Road, where they took a very strong contra stance very early on. But Admiral Harris, uh, you were dealing with very high level Indian interlocutors as the top US military commander in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you've watched this country evolve enormously over your career, engaging with them uh, in different ways. Uh, the Indians, it feels to me, are in some cases more hawkish and more skeptical of Chinese intentions than some of our actual core military allies. Uh, where do you see India coming out in this equation uh, in terms of its working with us? Yeah. So uh, an important question. Uh, I think that uh, to, to build on what Minister Bishop said, I, I think that 
China is our best uh, friend when it comes to convincing other countries of the danger that Beijing presents, right? I mean, and India is, uh, is just one of many classic examples. So here's China pushing forward on some uh, idea of territoriality uh, that uh, uh, impinges on India's sovereignty. Uh, and you take Sri Lanka and you take the port of Amantoto. So they weaponized debt and turned uh, that the port into a 99 year lease uh, for China. We see them afoot in Europe, uh, in, uh, uh, in Montenegro most recently, uh, and in other places where they are weaponized in debt. And now we see it uh, with uh, weaponizing uh, vaccines. So uh, they are uh, convincing, they're doing our work for us and convincing other countries of the danger uh, that they present. Uh, I think India uh, is a tremendous friend of the United States uh, and of Australia. Uh, and as, as uh, Minister Bishop has said, they are the world's largest democracy. They are a fiercely uh, independent country uh, and uh, they pick their friends carefully. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we're fortunate to be uh, one of their friends. Um, they have, uh, for example, uh, I think the largest uh, um, uh, uh, transport fleet, uh, air transport fleet uh, uh, in the world next to, next to ours the, and, and their American products. They, they are buying American goods uh, and, and that's important. Uh, on the issue of TPP, I agree with the minister completely. It would be tremendous uh, if the United States came back in the TPP. Of course, we have to uh, ask for the good uh, representation from the other members of TPP to let us in. Uh, but uh, I advocated for TPP publicly uh, while in uniform because I viewed it through a security lens and I used that approach to advocate for TPP. And then imagine uh, my disappointment uh, when we pulled out of uh, TPP itself. So uh, there's a lot to be said for it. Uh, I haven't thought this through at all, uh, but you, know, you, you take the quad and you take the TPP, uh, maybe there's a growth there. I think ASEAN nations would probably balk at that. But uh, there's a path there, I think, and certainly connective tissue that could be uh, built upon uh, over time if the United States came back uh, in the TPP. So it's very interesting that both of you as security experts are raising trade and TPP. And of course, I agree with you that there is a full spectrum competition underway in the Indo-Pacific as in the wider world around whose standards and values and norms and rules are going to prevail. And that competition is actually not taking place primarily in the military domain. It's taking place very much in the economic domain, in the technology domain, uh, in the information domain. So uh, I would like to ask Minister Bishop about the non-military challenge posed by China, by authoritarian values in your region. Um, you know, for all the Chinese military buildup, we saw China run a really dramatic ag offensive against Australia. Uh, including penetrating, attempting to penetrate your political institutions and your internal domestic politics, uh, not in ways designed to somehow level the playing field, but in ways designed to tilt it uh, and to sort of suborn Australian sovereignty in the direction of more pro-Beijing policies, including using United Front tactics, politicizing Chinese student groups, etc. Could you just talk, Minister, a little about Australia's experience with China's uh, ideological warfare, maybe too strong a term, but really it's, it's aggressiveness in the non-military domain as it relates to uh, the integrity of your own society and politics. Well, it's been a very challenging 12 months in terms of the Australia-China relationship. Uh, more broadly, I have uh, grave concerns about China's use of economic coercion to bully nations into aligning themselves with its worldview but also its corrupting influence um, over regional governments. And I'll come back to that. Uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party hopes to achieve its goals without firing a shot. And it has taken a very multifaceted approach to build its footprint across the Indo-Pacific. When it comes to Australia, China is our largest two-way trading partner. It accounts for about 40% of our international trade. And so I guess for the first time in our history, our major trading partner is not also our major strategic and defence partner, 
and also our major trading partner China is in economic conflict with our major defence and strategic ally in the United States. It's a difficult position to be in. But then um, China has exercised what I call economic coercion against Australia by targeting some of our exports, our wine, uh, coal, um, other agricultural products. The headline reason is because our Prime Minister called for an independent investigation into the origins of the pandemic and pointed at Wuhan and China. And apparently in China, that was seen as an attempt to uh, personally humiliate President Xi Jinping. So the Chinese officials feel duty bound to retaliate and humiliate Australia. And then the embassy in Canberra, the Chinese embassy, <laughs> released a list of 14 grievances, not 12, not 15, but 14 grievances that China had against Australia. The message being that unless Australia changed its ways and um, aligned itself with China's worldview, we would continue to be in the diplomatic deep freeze. And I understand that our officials are still not able to make contact with their counterparts. There've been no ministerial visits. Uh, there is, the diplomatic channels have been closed. Now, Australia, because we're just very pragmatic people, have um, not responded. The tit for tat escalation will not occur diplomatically. Australia is getting on and finding other markets for our goods. And some may say not a moment too soon. But what concerns me is um, that China will not take any criticism from Australia, even helpful criticism about its conduct. I mean, the military bases that it's building on disputed islands. Um, no, it doesn't want conflict, but its intent on expanding, as we've seen with its conduct over the um, Whitsun Reef recently, and it is testing the resolve of the United States. Um, it ignores the UNCLOS arbitration finding in favour of the Philippines, uh, which essentially said that the nine dash line has no geographic, historic, strategic um, significance at all. And yet uh, China is continuing to uh, push its military base expansion. Uh, the pressure, the unrelenting pressure on Taiwan, they're obviously seeking to break the will of Taiwan and build acceptance of the inevitability of Taiwan being absorbed by mainland rule. Um, it's testing the resolve of Japan over the Senkaku Islands, just you know, wearing down Japan's resolve so that China can occupy the Senkakus, what they call the Daiwu Islands without conflict. Um, this economic coercion actually does um, risk overreach uh, that countries will uh, respond by looking elsewhere for markets as Australia has done. But I mentioned another issue that really concerns me, and, and this does involve Australia to this extent. Um, corruption is enabling China to build influence in developing countries at a fraction of the cost of the aid budget that Australia or the US or Japan or any other developed country in our region is able to invest. Um, our businesses can't compete um, with Chinese businesses. It is not a level playing field. And uh, we're finding it a real challenge to explain to our neighbours that China's intentions are to invest in what might seem to be a civilian port but through a debt for equity swap because of the vulnerability of their economies, it will end up being a military port. And that's what concerns me in our part of the world. We're already seeing China making significant overtures in Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands that they are going to invest heavily in um, infrastructure for civilian use. But as we've seen in Sri Lanka, that civilian use soon turns to military. And that is a challenge to Australia's independence and our freedom. I'm so glad you raised that, Minister. My institute, which Senator McCain chaired for 25 years, which I think is why I'm here, uh, does a lot of work around clean politics, open government, transparency and accountability all over the world. And we have recently in the last few years opened in the Pacific Islands. 
And we do see a pattern that the more uh, robust democratic institutions are in third countries, the better able they're able to manage uh, forms of Chinese inducement, uh, coercion, corruption, penetration, where free media exists, where institutions are open and transparent, where there's rule of law. Countries just enjoy a form of democratic resiliency that the Chinese otherwise yeah. chip away at. And it, it, of course, it's very acute in your region, but it's acute well beyond the region, just in the news uh, recently has been the situation of Montenegro, which now owes the first allotment of its debt repayment to China to the tune of a billion dollars, which the country doesn't have uh, for infrastructure work the Chinese promised and did not deliver on. And now there's a question of can the European Union bail out this country in Europe because of these Chinese bad debts? Um, Admiral and Harris, there's, a, there's, a, there's a naive assumption on the part of some of the developing nations that China will forgive the debt. And that's not going to happen. You know, you might be able to get that from the World Bank. You might be able to get that from the Asia Development Bank. They would restructure the debt. But in the case of China, it's a straight debt for equity swap. Indeed. And I think the more Australia uh, and all of us can tell that story to our partners, the, the better we can uh, enable them to manage the situation. Admiral Harris, uh, we've only got uh, five or six minutes here. And I just want to, I do want to make sure we talk about the Korean Peninsula. Yeah. It's so yeah. easy to talk about these many other uh, uh, conflicts and pressure points in the region. Uh, you uh, were very laser focused on it as a military man. Uh, you lived there as our top representative, as ambassador. Uh, how do you see the North Korea situation today growing more dangerous? And what do we need to do? You know, President Trump tried a historic and unprecedented summit with Kim Jong Un. We've tried excessive, extensive sanctions. We've tried all forms of diplomacy, bilateral, multilateral. Uh, where does this go? And what do we need to do? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that uh, question. Um, as everyone knows, the administration, the Biden administration is working on a North Korea comprehensive policy statement, which should be out soon. So I don't want to get ahead of them. Uh, you know, I'm not part of that uh, discussion uh, and I don't want to, uh, you know, silently advise them from afar or something like that. Uh, I will say that uh, I think that the threat from North Korea is greater today than it ever has been. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, Chairman Kim, uh, he, he clearly wants four things. Uh, he wants sanctions relief. Uh, he wants to keep his nukes. Uh, he wants to split the U.S. ROK alliance. Uh, and ultimately, he wants to dominate uh, the peninsula uh, uh, in a way that's, uh, that looks more like North Korea today than South Korea today. Uh, I think those are his goals. There is, they were his father's goals and his grandfather's goals, and nothing has changed. Uh, so I think that as we go forward with whatever it is uh, that, that the United States decides to do with our ROK ally, with our South Korean ally, that we, we should keep that in mind. Uh, I think that uh, the idea that pressure alone will, uh, is sufficient is, is wrong. Pressure alone uh, is insufficient. But we've seen that over time. Uh, and I think uh, uh, we have to be open uh, to diplomatic uh, approaches as well. But I do believe, and I've said this publicly when I was in Seoul, I've said it since then at various fora, that sanctions relief uh, in order to, as an inducement, to bring uh, North Korea back to the negotiating table is a flawed approach. Uh, sanctions relief uh, in some form as an outcome of negotiations, sure. Uh, that's why you have negotiations, uh, to give and take on both sides. Uh, but, to, but to give up stuff just to get them to negotiate uh, is a wrong approach. To give up exercises that affects our military readiness uh, to counter any threat from North Korea, to give them up uh, to induce North Korea uh, to the negotiating table is a flawed approach. And, and in the long run, it won't work. You know, this is like uh, uh, the apocryphal uh, description of insanity by Einstein. You know, you do the same experiment over and over again and hope for a different outcome. So we have been down this road before. So let's not uh, rewalk the same path. Let's try something new. President Trump tried something new. Uh, there was no uh, or inadequate follow through on that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and all, all of the, uh, the, the, the faults that can rightly be pointed at Singapore and all of that. But it was something new. So let's build on that. 
building on where Singapore left off uh, may be a good place to start. We don't have to go back to square one, uh, even though uh, Kim Jong-un has started to go down that path with his recent provocations and the potential uh, increased provocations uh, with a new submarine and submarine launch uh, ballistic missiles and all of that. Uh, he hasn't done it yet. Uh, so this may be a, an opportunity and we should be open to that opportunity. I'm interested just as uh, you are, and I'm sure everyone else is on what uh, uh, this policy review uh, will reveal about our uh, new approach uh, to North Korea. I'm optimistic and hopeful at the same time. Thank you. I want to give Minister Bishop the last word, but Admiral, I, I would be remiss in uh, letting you go without asking you about the decision to withdraw American forces from Afghanistan. Uh, my friends who are military officers seem to have very mixed views about this, appreciating the extraordinary sacrifice that not just Americans, but our many allies have made there, including Australia. Um, is this going to enable us to really do the pivot to Asia, to really focus in on security challenges in this region, or do you worry uh, that the situation might be more analogous to the withdrawal from Iraq, which then led us to have to fight our way back in a few years later as the security situation deteriorated. Yeah, so uh, I think it's early days yet. I think the, the final uh, uh, picture of what this withdrawal is, uh, will look like is yet to be painted. Uh, I think that uh, it's being developed uh, now. Uh, there is uh, a lot to be said for uh, an interminable forever war, right? We've been at it for uh, 20 years or 19 years, going on 20 years. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we certainly accomplished our mission objective uh, within the first uh, several months. Uh, and here we are 19 years beyond that, uh, new mission objectives. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's problematic for sure. Uh, I applaud uh, the Biden administration's uh, or the President Biden himself for making a hard decision. Uh, that's why we elected him uh, to make those kinds of decisions and, and he'll be accountable for the outcomes of that decision, uh, whichever way they go, whether they're positive or negative. So, uh, you know, I, I think uh, we'll have to see um, uh, how it goes. It's easy. It's easier to stay in than it is to get out for sure. And we're seeing the reaction from a broad, a broad swath, uh, bipartisan reaction, really, on both sides of that question. You know, a dumb decision, good decision. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's certainly an emotional decision for many, for many of us who were involved in Afghanistan personally and, and, uh, and, and our friends and colleagues who, who fought there, died there. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a decision that, uh, that's been made, I think. Uh, but again, I think the final picture of what this withdrawal looks like uh, is yet to be determined. We'll have to see how it goes over the next couple of months. Thank you. Minister Bishop, just final thoughts from you as we close out here, just for a minute or so. On Afghanistan? Yeah, yes, please. Or on, you know, the broader tension and, you know, uh, the American focus on the Indo-Pacific versus the Middle East. You know, it's a recurring theme well, for Australia. Well, yes, we most certainly welcome the Obama administration's announcement of a pivot to the Indo-Pacific during the Obama administration's um, earlier years. But of course, there were always so many competing and distracting uh, missions around the world that uh, demanded US attention. Afghanistan, there are no good choices. Uh, we were there for the purposes after September 11 to ensure that Afghanistan didn't harbor terrorists. And we have achieved a great deal over the years. I mean, there is a flawed but functioning democracy in Afghanistan. My fear, of course, is that with the withdrawal of um, US, NATO, Australia, and others, uh, we will see a Taliban resurgence that may well undo the good work that's been achieved. And we have to be concerned about how Afghanistan uh, is secured in the future. I mean, yes, I know President Biden suggested that there are other nations in the region who have an interest in a stable and secure Afghanistan, but I don't believe those countries' interests necessarily align with the interests of the US, Australia and other um, open and free societies. Uh, so that is a challenge, but I am certainly delighted to see the new Biden administration uh, personnel 
uh, that we know well here in Australia, Kurt Campbell, Jake Sullivan, uh, a number of top US officials who have outstanding reputations and records. Um, they will be very much welcomed and we look forward to working closely with the United States on our efforts to ensure that there's more US leadership in the Indo-Pacific and not less. That's great. And we need to keep hearing that from our friends and allies. So thank you both, uh, Minister Bishop Admiral Harris. It's really great to be here with all our friends from the McCain Institute at the Sedona Forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great to see you, you, Minister.